So welcome to uh, Think About Process. My name is Robert Whiting. I am a developer team lead, and I like to think about process. So first things first, uh, we're actually going to talk about what is process, not just what general process is, but what it should be. So kind of a where we are, where we're headed. Uh, then we're going to talk about all the bad stuff, the the process that, that we hear about that just has all that bad reputation along with it. Then we're going to talk about the case studies. The case studies is the fun part. That's where we're going to talk about things in the world that are really awesome. And that's going to be the fun part. You guys are going to be super, super excited about the, the uh, awesome case studies that I pulled from the real world. And then I'm going to distill those things down into some awesome goodness that you can take home and uh, use on your own teams. All right. So, what is this process? Why is it so vague? Why are we doing, like, it, it, process is just such a vague word. So let's, let's get some definitions behind here. Um, a process is a series of actions in order to get something done. So, you had a process in order to get here. You filled out a form that said you wanted to go to some presentation. You went through some mental checklist of priorities and what's available and what's not. Uh, maybe you chose rooms based on how close they are to the elevator. I don't know. Uh, and then you found your way to the room based on some location, and here you are. Welcome to how to do processes. You have actually accomplished many processes already today. Congratulations. But we want to work towards something better. So we want a repeatable set of actions that actually multiply effectiveness. And this is really important. We want to make sure that we're working on things that are multiplying something that is important. You're going to notice as we go through this whole thing that if you're multiplying by zero, you get zero. And if you're multiplying by something negative, you're just going to get a whole lot more of that negative. So whatever we're multiplying is just as important as the process that we use to multiply that. So we want something good, and then we want to have a positive multiplier on it. So the process is only as good as the thing that you've got the process working on. So the bad stuff. And you all know what this is. Uh, so when process gets way more important than the people, we forget that it's the people that are actually solving the problems. It's the people that are actually on the teams. It's the people that are actually getting the work done on a day-to-day -day process, on a day-to-day -day level. The process isn't actually doing any work. It's the people doing the processes. And if you focus too much on the processes, you lose you lose the fact that there are people there, and they're human beings, and they have lives, and they have backgrounds, and they, something bad happened to them this morning. And if we over-standardize and over-sanitize, then we lose our humanity. And there are so many examples in media and in our day-to-day -day lives. You can just see where people are looking way past the humanity and way past the people and looking just at the processes. And we don't want that to happen. So then you've got just not getting work done. If you spend all your time working on the process, but not actually doing the work, then nothing gets done. This is the multiplying by zero. This is the, we've built a process. It sounds really awesome. We're going we're gonna, to you know, get super into it, and it's not going to do anything because it's just overanalyzed. It's empty. And we don't want to do that either. Hopefully. These are fairly obvious. I actually had a whole bunch more examples, but I pulled them all out because really, we know what bad process looks like. It sucks the soul, and we don't want that. What we want is we want some good examples. So here we are at the fun part. So we're going to talk about Google's hiring process. And this is the part where I actually go through all my caveats, so bear with me. I am not saying that we should hire like Google. Google has their process, and we have our process. We need to work on our process. Maybe we can take some principles. But we're not going to do their process for hiring. We're going to do our process for hiring. So we're going to look at how they do hiring and, and why it works the way it does work and pull some principles out of it. Then we're going to look at GitHub and how they do deployment. The caveat, we should not do deployment the way GitHub does deployment. They have different client sets. They have different parameters. They have different developers. They have a different system. We should not do it the way they're doing it, but we should learn from 
things that they're doing. Like their process has some really cool merits. And then third, we're going to look at Amazon fulfillment. Now, the reason I put this one in here is because the way that Amazon does their shipping and fulfillment stuff is nowhere near what we do. We don't do any of that yet. <laughs> but we should not try and implement their shipping and fulfillment here. We should find the principles and apply them in places where they make sense. So this is mainly in there to, to help break that like, oh, well, we should just do that here. It doesn't work that way. We actually have to own it. We have to bring it as part of our own system and build it into something that we do. So with all those caveats aside, let's move into Google, case study one of three. So what is their process? Well, it's a, it's a set of lessons learned that actually, uh, they're, they're just a set of guiding principles. So it's actually a lot more vague than I thought it was going to be when I looked it up. It is encapsulated in a book. So it is fairly well documented in this book called Work Rules by uh, Laszlo Bach. And we're going to look into some of those. So it is research-based entirely. Like they, they do so many numbers, so many more numbers than I think we even could do if we tried. Um, they say that an unstructured interview can explain only 14% of an employee's future performance. And future performance is what an interview is really about. You want to see how valuable is this person how are they, you know, are they going to be somebody that we want long term in our company? And so they, they found this is only 14%. So we need something with more than 14% to base our, our data off of. Is there something better out there? And so they said, well, let's, uh, let's run some A-B tests. Let's do some research. Let's read some white papers. And so they did. And they found that the best predict predictor of work over the long haul is actually sample work. So they bring people in, and they do sample work similar to the kind of work that they would be doing at Google. That predictor actually uh, correlates to 29% of, you know, the, compared to this 14% of future performance. It's really hard to do, though, because companies have different kinds of work. And they said, well, we need something. We, we need more factors. 29% is even not that great. If you take this 29% along with that 14%, it's not bad. So then they did some more A-B testing, and they did some more things. And they found out that the second best predictor was actually general uh, cognitive ability tests. And that's actually 26% uh, next to the 29%. And so that's like an IQ test. But then there's all kinds of problems with an IQ test, because IQ tests are actually somewhat biased in the way that they are presented for how people learn, and how people have grown up, and the way that people take standardized testing. And so then they're working along with all of that. It's extremely research-based, which is awesome and important for being able to actually have data behind it instead of just opinions behind it. Next, they remove biases. And this kind of came out of how do we hire? Well, if a test is something that really gives us a lot of bang for our buck on getting somebody useful at Google, how do we remove those biases? And so in the rest of the interview process, they've worked on making sure that the hiring manager actually has little to no say in whether or not somebody's hired. Um, they make sure that a lot of non-interested parties are involved in the, in the interviewing process. And they use a standard rubric so that all of the notes are taken and recorded. And people can look at it afterwards and go, we should hire this person because of the data, because of how they answered things. Not because they had a good first impression, or they had a, had a fancy handshake, or they had like the perfect eye contact, or whatever it is that influences people in the heat of the moment in the interview. Because you know interviews are like super intense. All right, so they are measurable and repeatable. So they take these notes, and they write down not only the question that they asked, but the answer that was given. So that after the fact, you can actually look up what somebody asked and what they answered. So you can look at it on their merits and not necessarily on the delivery. Uh, and they, ask, they actually ask a, they have a bank of questions, and they're all boring questions. And this is on purpose. So the questions that Google asks, they're boring, dumb questions that actually evoke strong, good answers. And this is important because if you're interviewing somebody, you don't want to be showing off how awesome of an interviewer, interviewer you are. You're already hired. You want to know what experiences the people have that they can offer, that they can bring into your company. And so they ask questions like this. Tell me about a time when your behavior had a positive impact on your team. Well, that's a generic question. That sounds really boring. But that's actually going to give you a story of what happened on their team, what conflicts happened, how they actually resolved it. And then you can have the follow-up questions of, so what was your goal in how you did that and why? 
uh, moving forward, how do you actually how do you actually have um, good interactions with the people on your team uh, around that impact? Did you actually like did you step on toes when you made this positive impact on your team? Um, were there conflicts? You can just work through all those issues and find the story of where they're coming from. And yeah, people can game the system, people can make up stories, but when people are making up stories, we as humans have the ability to actually figure those out over time. You, you, you kind of piece together a whole story and you can find out if somebody's trying to game the system, if somebody's not being genuine and honest. And that actually pulls out a lot of the extra problems with uh, actually asking these boring questions with, with really cool answers. So, uh, constant improvement. Their system, they are always running more tests. They're always doing A-B testing so that they can find the problems, they can make their system better. So everybody in the company, once you're finally hired on, you have access to all of it. There's a huge trust barrier that you pass. And so you can actually look at all prior interviews, all the questions asked. This is not just if you're on an interview. Like If you're in the company, you can see this data. You can go in, and not only can you see other people's interview questions and interview answers, but you can actually look at their hire rate. Like based on their recommendation, like if they interview 100 people and they recommended 50% of them and you know, 40 of those got hired, you're like, wow, that person actually has a pretty good rate of the people they recommend versus the people that were actually hired. I should learn from that person. And then you can look at yourself and you can go, my hire rate based on recommendation is not that great. How can I improve? How can I, how can I make this thing better? And then you can look at their questions, their answers, and actually work your way through the process to be better as an interviewer and then you can have that feedback back into the system so they can change the questions, they can change the formats so that the system is better. Next, GitHub. GitHub is a very different system, very different process from how Google does things because they actually start with a why. Now Google has a why, everybody has a why, but their why is actually pretty cool. Their why is developers and designers are responsible for shipping new stuff themselves as soon as it is ready. And that means that the deployment, deploying needs to be as smooth and safe a process as possible. And so they actually have their process as a simple checklist. It's just a little list. It's, it's actually like really, really easy to just put here on the screen for you. And so they push changes to a branch. They wait for the build to pass. They tell Hubot to deploy it. They verify that it's working, fix any problems as they're going. And then they merge the branch into master. The rest is magic. It just goes. It's in production. And then what? That seems too short. It seems like, well, how do they make sure it's working in production? What if things go wrong? Well, they have systems around that. And they have an understanding around that. But this checklist actually gives them the whole like code stuff and get it out quickly and sustainably. Uh, with all their other subsystems around it. So what they do is they actually consider something stable if it's working in production for 15 minutes. And that's like for a moderate size change. That's not for like tiny stuff. Tiny stuff, they're like, eh, just ship it. For the big stuff, they probably wait like a whole like 20, 30 minutes maybe. <laughs> um, and then they monitor those, they, they monitor production. They, they ship it and then they, they take a look at you know, their, their server metrics. They're watching performance things. They're actually watching tweets to see if stuff is broken that they didn't notice. Um, it's very different from how we do things at Clearwater. I don't think that we actually monitor tweets, and I don't think it would help <laughs> if we did. Uh, I, I'm not sure if our clients are on Twitter going, oh man, the Clearwater system just like started getting slower all of a sudden after the deploy window. It just doesn't happen the way we do it. But for them, it actually works really well because they have this huge distributed set of people that are working on it in different areas, uh, in different with different circumstances around each one. So they can actually monitor uh, those tweets and then they can do those verifications and make sure everything's working. And then what's really cool is if something is really wrong, they can roll back master in 30 seconds. So they can just be like, nope. <laughs> and so the, the risk is actually really, really low. So uh, also, side note, Hubot, you may recognize that as something that we have available here. I didn't just inject that because it's like a chat bot and we have a chat bot. Um, Hubot was developed by GitHub for automation, for scalability, to improve their employee effectiveness. We happen to have an instance here. 
So I didn't make that up. That's, that's their tool, not ours. So the result, pretty good. These are uh, total number of builds per day and total number of deploys per day. The, the blue on the screen here is actual deploys to production. And that's a lot. That's like 25-ish uh, percent, I want to say, across the board there. Uh, and that's way more deploys than we do because they have this lightweight system where they can just roll it back. And they're, they're using users to do stuff. And they have this system they've built over time. So why does it work? Well, it's got nothing extra. It's, their checklist is really short. And they've got the tools around it to do all the extra stuff. It has no extra steps, no extra handoffs. The developer gets the feature, does the feature, ships the feature. And so there's not a lot of extra moving things around. It's bought in. Everybody on the team understands the process, likes the process, and uses the process. They, they're excited about it. Like This is a thing they're proud of. Measured and updated. Sound familiar? So they actually keep track of all the problems they're having so that they can write more tooling around their systems so that uh, they can have better rollback scripts, so that they can have uh, better unit testing, so they can have better system testing. Because they have all these automated tests that run so that they can say, ah, yes, it's functioning solidly in production. All these 15 minutes I've been testing it. So it's actually very robust. It looks really lightweight, but they've got a whole bunch of stuff they've built in the background. And that all comes from measuring it, seeing what worked, seeing what didn't, and then making changes to make that as easy, easy and simple and automatable as possible. It's a lot of bulls. And it is effective. It is extremely effective. Um, this is one of the most trusted places to keep code on the internet. Like, and there's a lot of code in the world. There's over 69 million projects on GitHub. Million projects. Not lines of code, not files, projects. And each of those projects is forked into other projects and has groups of users developing it. It is very effective the way that they're doing their deployment process. So let's move on. Now we're into Amazon. So they do stuff very differently in their system. And it's an extremely different process because what they do is they reduce human error with a physical layout. So completely different from how Google's doing, or from how Google's doing their hiring, completely different from how GitHub is doing their deployment process. And that's because I want to make sure that we're looking at the big picture of what process is actually doing and the pieces of process that make it work. So, you guys may or may not be familiar with buying things on Amazon and receiving something in the mail. Well, it starts here at the inbound dock. So people that have stuff that they want to sell to you on Amazon, they send it to Amazon. And first, they check it for quality. They inspect it to see if it got broken between Amazon and the people that sent it to them, or if it got broken somewhere in the warehouse, because that matters. If it gets broken before it arrives, then that's on the shipping's fault of whoever sent it. So they check it, they label it, and they, they put a unique ID on there. And then from there, um, they randomize things. They use randomized shelving throughout their entire warehouse. They just, like, a robot picks a place, puts something there. Why, why random? And why different color bins? And why is it so light if it's run by robots? Well, the yellow bins are to reduce confusion. Yellow bins are all incoming. That's all stuff coming into the warehouse. Orange bins are all stuff going out of the warehouse. It's just a physical characteristic of how they have things so that mistakes don't get made. Uh, and they reduce human error by doing random shelving so that when they go to pick something off the shelf and you ordered Star Wars Episode One, why would you do that, first off? That they don't like try and correct your mistake and be like, oh, well, they meant, you know, they meant the, the real one, like you know, A New Hope. Because they're not next to each other on the shelf. They're random. And so episode one is going to be right next to some Legos or diapers or whatever it may be. And so that reduces the human error. So they're not grabbing between similar things. Like, I'm looking for a DVD. This is the only DVD in this whole section. So it reduces human error with the physical layout. And then they get into the shopping part. 
And yes, this still does happen. You've heard a lot about Amazon robots doing all kinds of cool stuff. And yes, there are lots of cool robots doing lots of cool things at Amazon, but they still actually have human pickers for human shopping. And what they do is they grab a shopping cart with orange bins outbound. They get a list generated by a computer for an optimal walking path, and they will walk around and they will pick things off the shelf and put it in there and then ship it. So then the packaging happens. And all these little pieces go flying down a conveyor belt, and they weigh it, and they size it, and they say, this should fit inside this size box. And so after all that scanning and packing into a box for multiple items, then it goes down into actual labeling. This entire time, it has no shipping label on it. It has no, the buyer wanted these things. It's all based off of one ID on one item and a computer server somewhere. So it gets here. It's all been in the, it's all already inside of a packaging box. It goes down. They call this actually the slammer. This is slam, slam four. And this actually does one more check. It says, let's weigh this one more time and see if it, the weight of it actually matches with all the combined things that are supposed to be in here. So they weigh it, they slam on the label, and it goes off to shipping. And you would think, well, shipping, yeah. It goes out, it gets loaded into the truck, and off it goes. Well, it's even more complicated than that because the people that pick up from these Amazon warehouses actually have different schedules. And so you've got a truck coming in at 9, you've got another truck coming in at 10. And so they actually optimize their picking off the shelves and their planning of all these things off of when the, sh when the actual trucks are leaving. So the truck that leaves at 9 that's going to Cincinnati, we need to make sure that all the stuff that goes into there has to be picked, packaged, and ready to go before the stuff that leaves at 10. And so they've got all kinds of extra automation built around that thing. It is extremely effective. That's why it works. Because they let us get stuff in two or three days uh, based off of how they are, they're, they're pulling out all of the human error and they're making it really, really efficient. There's no waste. There's no repetition. There's no trying things again. It works the first time and it works really well. It is usable. It makes sense. If you walked into an Amazon warehouse and you saw a yellow bin, you'd, be, you'd, you'd go inbound. You saw stuff in it, you'd be like, oh, that's not, we don't need to worry about that. It needs to go to a shelf, but we're not trying to get that out to a client. It's easy to understand in the physical layout of it because they actually have the inbound stuff coming in one side, and they've got all the shelves there with all the stuff on it. And it just makes sense. You just walk through the whole process. If you ask somebody what their job is there, it would just make sense because it all fits into this very simple process. And everybody there understands it and uses it. So it is measured and updated. Uh, anytime there's a problem in there, somebody reports it because they have their buy-in. They want it to work. And when there's problems that are repeated, like grabbing one DVD instead of another DVD off the shelf, they're willing to take a look at the whole process and make huge adjustments to remove those problems but still have the effectiveness of the whole system. And the, the randomized shelving, like that is the perfect example of something completely not intuitive that solves a really important problem that you wouldn't get if you didn't have somebody looking at it and going, how can we, how can we fix this and make it completely different and yet exactly the same? So the important part. So now we're to the summary. This is the let's grab all these principles from these three extremely different examples, pull it all together, and package it up for use here. So they're very different because we've got a set of principles that are wrapped up into a whole book that's like this thick. We've got a, a very short list for deployment, and we've got an actual physical layout. So how do we make this our own? So first off, we need to make sure that the processes we're using are effective. We need to make sure uh, that they are all doing what they're supposed to do. All three of these, Google and GitHub and Amazon, all their processes are effective. They actually do the thing they're supposed to do without a whole bunch of extras. Uh, it has to be working on something that's actually important. It has to be contributing not only to what that individual process is trying to get done, but what, to, what the company as a whole is trying to get done. So at Google, they're trying to get software written to organize data across the world. That's their mission. How do they do that? They do that by getting really good engineers 
And so it's really good for the HR department to have good a good process, but it's also good for the whole company. And the same applies to the other two. I'm not just going to repeat it. All right, documented. This is the part where eyes glaze, if they're not already. Uh, these processes have to be documented, because if they're not documented, they turn into uh, a cultural thing, a tribal knowledge that drifts over time based off of opinions, not off of data. So all three of these cases have things extremely well documented. Like GitHub's like little check checklist is an awesome example of how to get things done. Now they have other documentation on how to actually use Hubot and how to actually roll stuff back in production, how to actually interact with these systems. But that checklist is vital to them being able to go back to it and say, no, you go through these steps. You don't go through whatever steps you feel like. So it makes it also easy to pass on the whole thing accurately to another team, to another person that's coming onto the team, or to a whole other company. Other companies use the GitHub deployment process. Uh, and other companies try and do the uh, Google hiring process, but they can only do that because it's really well documented. So next up, it's bought in. People actually understand it, they like it, they want to do it. So if you have a process, you have to get buy-in. You have to explain why it's important. You have to get people to be excited about it and go, yes, this is a thing that I not only agree with theoretically, but I want to do this. I want to make it actually work. If you have a process that seems like it's a good idea and people are like, yeah, that's, that seems like a good idea, but it's super painful and nobody wants to do it, they won't do it. They just won't. And if they're not bought in, if they're not actually using it, then you're not going to have that feedback model to make it better. You're not going to have all these other pieces along with it. Nobody's going to take the time to document it if nobody cares, if nobody wants it, if nobody likes it. Next, it is always improving. Every single one of these, they have a thing in there that has a feedback cycle. It is measurable and it is actually measured. You have to have data coming out of this. You have to say, yeah, this actually makes our team more effective. Yeah, it actually shortens our design cycle. Yep, it actually lets us ship stuff better, faster, with fewer errors in it. If you're not measuring it, you can't make it better. And if you're not um, watching the process in a controlled way, then you can't improve it to make it more consistent in its execution. Um, you can't build on a prior design if you haven't actually looked at the prior design. So it has to be constantly improving, both from outside sources and from your own testing and from research out in the world. And simple. Processes have to be simple. This is the only one up here that I put up here that only two of the three have actually applied. And I think that there is actually a huge impact on the one company that did not make their process simple. And that is, GitHub has a really simple process. Amazon has a really, really simple process. But Google's hiring process is not simple. It's complicated. It's got lots of things in it. It's a little fuzzy. It's got a whole book based on what it is. But it's not simple. And theirs is really effective because they understand it. And they're bought in. And they've got feedback loops. They've got all these other things. But other companies that try and implement it have a hard time implementing it because it's not boiled down into its simple pieces. And so they can do it because they fully understand it and it's really part of their culture and they, they, they get it. It's really bought in and it's really a part of their culture. But if it's not simple, if it's not something that other people can grasp, it's really hard to pass it along. So without, without hammering on that too much, it's really, really important to be simple. This is why people all over the world use the GitHub deploy process, which is why warehouses are working more and more like being like Amazon because they've got these really cool processes that work really well, they're simple, and you can just absorb them. So it needs to be a simple process. That actually helps out with the buy-in. It helps out with the feedback loop. It helps out with the other things. All of these principles layer on each other and multiply on each other. They're like little mini processes within the process. So circle back around. We want a repeatable set of actions that multiply your effectiveness. And each of these principles that we've talked about, they multiply the effectiveness of the whole process, which turns into the multiplier on the thing that you're trying to do. So we want all of the processes here at Clearwater to, uh, to have this. You, you want to take a look at it. Make sure it's actually doing the thing that it's supposed to do. Make sure it's effective. It's work, the, the thing you're working on is what you actually want to work on. And then the process actually multiplies that in a positive way. 
So we want to make sure that we're multiplying that effectiveness. We want to make sure that our, our deploys actually make sense. We're deploying the right things, and that we're deploying them effectively and quickly and simply. We want to make sure that our meetings are being run well. We want to make sure that our API changes uh, are uh, not running over the people downstream. We want to make sure that our testing makes sense. It's simple. It's manageable, that we're updating it. We want to make sure that our code reviews are actually getting, giving us the benefit that we want out of them. We don't want to just mandate things to say, you must do code reviews, because theoretically that makes sense. Everybody wants to do code reviews. But if you haven't actually talked to people and figured out why they're hesitant to use it, if it's not bought in, if everybody on the team isn't really excited to give feedback to make things better, then it's not going to happen. And you'll have this theoretical process out there that we do that no one's doing. And then it, won't, it can't get better, because it won't be documented, it won't be bought in, it won't be used. So shameless plug, if you want to be a part of figuring out process, sharing these process ideas across the company, there's a group called the How to Team Groups. And we, you get together in a small group, and you meet once a week throughout the quarter to figure out how can we multiply uh, our teams, how can we share these processes, how can we, as a company, be better at the things that we're doing. And I am keeping it generic on purpose, because we talk about everything from, uh, from how we actually deploy code, to how we run planning, to how we do one-on-ones, everything in between on process. How can we spend some time and just take a few minutes and think about our processes and see if we can make them just a little bit better? That is all. Are there any questions? Um, so you mentioned data and it being helpful for both assessing effectiveness and improving on your processes. Do you have an example of how you gathered that data and then used it to either improve or just kind of assess effectiveness in general? OK. So the question is, uh, how do we use data in our processes to make it more effective? Like an actual example. Uh, that's actually probably the weakest part of how, what we do on our team especially. I mean, I don't know what other teams are doing. But we actually do a very poor job, I, I think I can probably speak for the company, on keeping metrics on our development time, on our, you know, how long it takes to build a case, and the defects that come out of each of those. And so I would say this is a thing that I want to work on. Uh, that actually came out of researching this, trying to figure out what other companies are doing. So I don't actually have a good example of how we're doing this. Uh, we are doing that part poorly. And I think that's something that we need to leverage so that we can actually make our processes more effective. Because a lot of the processes that we're working on are based off of gut feel of like, yeah, we think our team is doing rel well at this area. So, so I'm sorry, but we don't have a good example. We're, we're not doing it well, and we need to. If there's hands behind this light, I, I can't see it. Oh, yeah. So the question is, how, as an outsider, can we get buy-in and actually affect change in processes? Uh, so the, the way that I've seen it happen is slowly pushing. And there's a lot of human element and spending time talking to people and comparing processes. If we had the data, it would make it a lot easier to be able to say, process A does this, process B does this. Look at the data, check it out, it's awesome. Since we don't have that, we have to end up using a lot of the comparative model of, well, our team ships things really well, and we seem to be fairly stable. And your team uh, ships things very infrequently, and everything's broken all the time. So maybe that is somehow related to this process that we're doing that you're not doing. Maybe you should try it. And trying to navigate those things in a very human way that is not condemning, but is a let us together do better. Uh, I have had some success uh, basically talking face-to-face -face with people. And if you get 
critical mass on a team bought into it, a lot of times they're willing to try it. It's when you come in with a, the ham-fisted approach, which I have also tried uh, several times, of this is horrible, we should change everything, um, we should just do everything the way Google does it. Uh, that doesn't work because it's, it's accusatory and it, it, just, it causes problems. Uh, and it, it doesn't actually work toward a we need to solve a problem. It's a you have a problem and you need to work on it. So I think it comes down to a we together need to work on this and working through those solutions. And it is a lot slower, but I think it's probably the fastest method available, actually. Yeah? Um, so thinking about the GitHub deployment, uh, and as I basically monitor uh, users, um, and I, I've also seen Google doing like betas, uh, and I, I saw that, for example, Facebook does like So they, let me see if I can rephrase your question. Um, do we do any kind of user acceptance testing using A-B testing or a small sample of users for beta products? Yeah, they have examples of that. Uh, we actually have the ability to do that here at Clearwater. Um, we have feature flags that you can turn on for users uh, or sets of users. We don't use it as often as we should. But it is available, and you can ship things to production with a a feature flag on for some users and not others users, or some clients so they can try it you can actually have it in production they can they can see if they like it uh, we like to have things really working before we get it out to production obviously but that should help us with um, getting things tested out uh, features if you have like two different options you can code those things up under a feature flag so and it looks like we are out of time <laughs>